Good afternoon, brethren. Certainly it's good to see everybody here today on this beautiful high Sabbath day. According to my calendar, the very first day of Unleavened Bread in 2019. I couldn't help but notice on the drive up here that there is absolutely not a cloud in the sky. No big, puffy, white, fluffy clouds. Just big, beautiful, sunny, shiny day. Excellent. Big, beautiful, full moon last night. It is God's holy day. We are here gathered to hear God's words expounded. I'd like to welcome everybody that's here. I'd like to welcome everybody that's on the internet. People that are hooked up via the phone hookup. See this video later on. We welcome you to Warden, and we hope that you are having a very, very wonderful High Sabbath day. Now, brethren, it is time to begin services, so I'll ask Eric Lee to come forward, give the opening prayer. Father in heaven, Father, thank you so much for this gorgeous high Sabbath day that you've given us. And thank you, Father, for the love and mercy that you show each one of us. And thank you, Father, for the calling. And Father, please help us to take this calling very serious and allowing us to be part of serving with you in your kingdom. And please help us just to grow in that knowledge of your plan. And Father, on this first day of Unleavened Bread, help us to use this week to continue to put sin out of our lives and concentrate on that and help us look to you. And Father, please just be with the service. Please inspire the speaking, inspire our hearing, and be with all your people around the world. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Brethren, if you're using the older hymnal, if you'd turn over to page 101, you're using the newer hymnal, so to speak. That's page 146. We'll sing our first selection today. Words taken from the 135th Psalm is praise God's name. Again, that's page 101 in the older hymnal, 146 in the new. Forward one page, if you're using the older hymnals, page 102, it's page 148 in the newer hymnal. His mercy never fails, page 102. Yeah. 
right, our next selection, if you'll turn forward in the back in the book to page number 62, excuse me, <clears throat> that's page number 89 in the older hymnal, we'll sing Praise the Eternal with a Psalm, again that's page 62 in the older hymnal, 89 in the new. May be seated, brother. Now to bring us today's offertory message and uh, announce the special music is Mr. Jason McCoy. Well, good afternoon to everyone here. And certainly all those that are Again, uh, another warm welcome for me to all of those behind the camera, listening in on the phone lines. It certainly is wonderful. We've got some faces here that it's been a little bit rarer that they've been here, so it's great to have everybody joined the home full and lots of smiling faces. And it certainly is uh, a blessing with the great uh, sunshine that's outside and the, the time to be together on this double Sabbath. Not only the Sabbath of the week, but a high Sabbath day for the annual Holy Day. Well, brethren, take, your, take with me and turn over to Deuteronomy 16 and verse 16. As we do, every, as a reminder, uh, each season, as we're instructed here, three times... A year all of your males shall appear before the Lord your God in a place which he chooses at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, at the Feast of Weeks, and the Feast of Tabernacles. Of course, we are here at this Feast of Unleavened Bread. And it instructs us, and they shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed. So they were instructed to bring an offering to present to the Lord. It was, a, it was an offering that they needed to bring each of them, and, <clears throat> excuse me, and it says in verse 17, every man shall give as he is able. It's important here that not only is it three times, but they are to give as they are able, according to the blessings 
of the Lord your God, which he has given to you. So they were to bring a, an offering before the Lord, and they were to present that there at that time. And of course, we know that those offerings could be many things. Today, it's most common that we bring monetary offerings and we present those. And just a couple other points, if you'll turn to 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 9, verse 7. So let each give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. They were commanded to bring, but it's, they were to, also commanded to bring and to give as their heart not grudgingly, not out of, you know, where they, they, they felt animosity towards that giving. But they had to give with a cheerful heart. And we know that all that we can give is nothing compared to what God has given us. Not only in this life, but what we've observed in the last couple of days with the gift of giving his son and Christ giving his own life for each and every one of us. What we can give back is nothing. And we should be very grateful and cheerful when we give a little bit of what we have back to God. After all, it is his that he gave to us in the first place. And when we do this, if you'll turn over to Matthew 6, Matthew 6, in verse 19, when we do this, we're laying up, we're taking our treasure and we're putting it where it should be. As in Matthew 6 and verse 19, parallel is in Luke 12 and verse 34. Matthew 6 and verse 19, do not lay up for yourselves treasure on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So we need to be treasuring that great gift that God has given us through life, through his son, through his grace that he gives to us. And we give back just that little bit. Three times in a year, we come together, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, Feast of Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles. So it's just a reminder each time that we go through these things. As everybody here is aware, we have a basket over here. You can place it in it. We don't pass it around here. And if there's a different organization that you wish for your donation to go to, you're able to write that on it. We will ensure that it gets out to, to that organization. So with that then we have that and it's up to you each as it purposes in your heart and for going on now we have also a special occasion today that uh, we have special music this special music is entitled waltz it was composed by jay brahms and a special day for myself and my wife because one of ours is going to perform today. So we will hear the waltz by Jay Brahms, performed by Kaylee McCoy. And following that, we will have the sermon by Mr. Steve Buchanan.
Oh, wasn't that special? I was talking quite a bit with, uh, with Kaylee about uh, coming up here and performing, and I told her, I guarantee, that's our first performance uh, as far as special music. And uh, I told her, I guarantee you, there were going to be several people, at least those of us who knew about it were more nervous than her. I don't think she believed me. But, uh, but I really appreciate her being willing to do that. That's not, it's not an easy thing to get up, even in front of people that you know and that you love and know that they're behind you. It's a hard thing to do. So thank you very much, Kaylee, for that. Greetings to all of you. Great to have you here. Tremendous time of year uh, when we consider all that we have uh, gone through through the Passover night to be much observed everything that we've had to reflect on once again this year and I think each year holds its own uniqueness its own specialty for each of us as we grow as we learn um, everything the the cumulative effect of everything that God has given us makes each Passover and each night to be much observed and each days of unleavened bread special and uh I just want to say greetings to all of you and greetings to those behind the camera. I hope that all of you there have had a great Passover and night to be much observed. I'd like to begin by asking if you turn back to Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12, we're going to begin reading here with verse 1. A lot of these scriptures that we're going to begin reading here, uh, we've read quite a bit. Uh, over the last several days, but I want to re, uh, try to f- uh, establish foundation as we build this message. Verse 1, it says, Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. And as we understand, as we've had pointed out over the years, Israel began to be dealt with God by God while they were still in Egypt while they were still in captivity God had to reorient begin to reorient their thinking as to came to the point of understanding God's calendar he had to tell them this is your beginning of months he had to let them know this is what it was and the reason is is that Israel was completely indoctrinated by the way of the Egyptians it doesn't involve just the calendar if we jump ahead several months Israel was in the desert and when Moses delayed his coming down what did they do They went right back to what they saw and what they understood that the Egyptians did. They built an idol. They had services and sexual immorality before that idol, as Egyptians did. They went back to what they were indoctrinated. It was in them. And that's what I want to emphasize at this point. Verse 3. Speak to all the congregation of Israel while they're in Egypt, saying, On the tenth of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the persons, according to each man's need, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year, You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. And they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses where they eat it. Then they shall eat the flesh on that night, roasted in fire. With unleavened bread and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Do not eat it raw, nor boil it all with water, but roast it in fire, its head with its legs and its entrails. You shall let none of it remain until morning, and what remains of it until morning you shall burn with fire. And thus you shall eat it with a belt on your waist, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, so you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover." 
For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. All of what God here gives to Israel is revealed knowledge revealed understanding they did not have before this moment in time he gave it to them while they were in egypt and as we understand through all of the plagues that god had performed up to this point in time this is the first time where participation by israel is required for them to reap the blessings that god had through this plague there is a faith and a belief that had been established in them through all of the first nine plagues that had taken place. A degree of faith and belief in God had been established to the point that now God was requiring them to act. And as you read through Scripture, there is not one indication of one Israelitish family who did not obey what God said. All of the Israelites, it appears, reaped the blessing that God revealed through what He was going to do. A prophecy for them that they had to have faith in God for. Verse 13, Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Depending on their obedience, God would bless. A distinction is made between the Israelites and the Egyptians in God's eyes. Depending on the participation and the belief of the Israelites. Verse 14. So this day shall be to you a memorial, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it as a feast by an everlasting ordinance. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall remove leaven from your houses. For whoever eats leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day that person shall be cut off from Israel. And as we see here, and as we see as we continue on through the Israelitish relationship with God, through the first nine plagues, God performed and made possible their freedom. But beginning with the tenth plague, and even through the first of these holy days that God gives, participation by Israel is required. God makes freedom possible. But at that point forward, there is a relationship and there's a responsibility involved by those who enter into this relationship with God. Verse 16, on the first day there shall be a holy convocation, and on the seventh day there shall be a holy convocation for you. No manner of work shall be done on them, but that which every one must eat, that only may be prepared by you. So you shall observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread, for on this same day I will have brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore you shall observe this day throughout your generations as an everlasting ordinance. Even through the days of unleavened bread, the emphasis is that God is going to bring them out of Egypt. The night to be much remembered is a night of beginning. The beginning steps that God made possible. The days of unleavened bread, as we have heard, is the length of our conversion to completely come out from Egypt. To completely come out from sin. Verse 18, In the first month, on the fourteenth day of the month, at evening, you shall eat unleavened bread until the twenty-first day of the month at evening. For seven days no leaven shall be found in your houses, since whoever eats what is leavened, that same person shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel. 
whether he is a stranger or a native of the land. Responsibility, participation involved, or they will cut themselves off. God doesn't have to do it. They cut themselves off. And I want to emphasize aspects of this as we go through this. <clears throat> Verse 20. You shall eat nothing leavened in all your dwellings. You shall eat unleavened bread. Through the remainder from verses 21 through 28, Moses repeats these instructions to the Israelites. This is all revealed grace, understanding, truth to Israel while they are in Egypt. While they're still captives. God began to teach His seasons, His plan, His way of life to them. Israel had been severely indoctrinated in Egypt's perspective of right and wrong, of what should be done or what should not have been done. As we all know, this is not just uh, attached to the calendar but in all ways were indoctrinated by the ways of the Egyptians. In Exodus 12, verse 40, it says, Now the sojourn of the children of Israel who lived in Egypt was 430 years. And we're not going to take the time. This 430 years goes back to the confirmation of the covenant between God and Abraham. That begins this 430 years. If we look back at the history, it's a little over 200 years that Israel was actually in captivity to Egypt. But what his emphasis is here is that every single Israelite alive, the only thing they knew was slavery. The only thing they understood was what they saw around them. Verse 41, and it came to pass at the end of the 430 years, on that very same day, again, God is in charge. It's His timing. You find nowhere in Scripture where, where Israel was to remember 430 years. It is God's plan that is being worked out here. It came to pass at the end of those 430 years that all the armies of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. They began their journey. It is a night of solemn observance to the Lord for bringing them out of the land of Egypt. This is that night of the Lord, a solemn observance for all the children of Israel throughout their generations. And as we repeated and rehearsed last night, the New International Version states, because the Lord kept vigil that night to bring them out of Egypt. On this night, all the Israelites are to keep vigil to honor the Lord for generations to come. Because of what God did, they were able to begin to leave Egypt. In Exodus chapter 13, verse 1, then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Consecrate to me all the firstborn, whatever opens the womb among the children of Israel, both of man and beast, it is mine. Those who were passed over were dedicated to God. They were His. He bought them. Verse 3, and Moses said to the people, remember this day in which you went out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. For by strength of hand the Lord brought you out of this place. And attached to that, no leavened bread shall be eaten. Those things are coupled together here. Verse 4, on this day you are going out in the month of Abib. And it shall be when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, which he swore to your fathers to give you, a land flowing with milk and honey, that you shall keep this service in this month. 
seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. No leavening should be seen among them. No leavening should be eaten. But the emphasis and the key here is that unleavened bread should be eaten seven days. And on the seventh day there shall be a feast to the Lord. Unleavened bread shall be eaten seven days. And no leavened bread shall be seen among you, nor shall leaven be seen among you in all your quarters. And you shall tell your son in that day, saying, he's talking about the days of unleavened bread. This is done because of what the Lord did for me when I came up from Egypt. The days of unleavened bread still looks back to God who makes it all possible. The lesson is this is done because of what the Lord did for me when I came up from Egypt. Verse 9, it shall be as a sign to you on your hand and as a memorial between your eyes that the Lord's law may be in your mouth for with a strong hand the Lord has brought you out of Egypt you shall therefore keep this ordinance in its seasons from year to year. Verse 9, what it talks about there is not just things that would happen during the days of unleavened bread, but that mark on their hand and the memorial between their eyes, all of this is supposed to affect their lives from that time moving forward. This very key and important truth this is done because of what the Lord did for me should forever influence their individual action is what the sign on the hand means forever affect their individual thought the memorial between their eyes and should forever affect their individual words the Lord's law being in their mouth from that time forward and should never be forgotten as we have come now through the spring holy days, all of these things are so much on our minds this time of year. And God does this for a reason, to reorient us, to bring and center us back into our relationship with God from all of the distractions that can happen. He does not want us to forget this, this key fact that God is the one who has done this. This is so important that God stated that each parent must pass these truths on from generation to generation. And this is not a time, the season of the year is not the only time that the parents talk to the children about the importance of this key fact. It's all their lives, through their words, through their example, through the way they live their lives, what they care about. This should be passed on. All of what we have talked about up to this point, are there are specific symbols that God uses each year for us to focus on to further teach us His purpose in these days of unleavened bread. This season, the Passover, the night to be much observed, the seven days of unleavened bread, are separate, separate and distinct, but they're so tightly connected as one, in one sense, that Jesus Christ is our Savior. God has saved us and made freedom possible, and we have the opportunity of a relationship with God to further that purpose that God desires in each of us. For the Passover, our focus is on the examples of Jesus Christ and His sacrifice, which makes possible a pathway for our hope of becoming like God and sharing eternity with them. We must approach that service with the understanding that because of what He chose to do in giving His life and sacrifice, we have extended to us this potential of life and spiritual freedom our death penalty that we had earned, each of us, he paid in our stead. Prior to this service, each of us were given the responsibility by God to examine our lives in comparison 
to that of Christ's many examples of love and service. And as each of us did, God made clear to each of us our desperate need for his acts of love and service and mercy, as well as his choice to sacrifice his life for us. The night to be much observed is for us to remember God's work to free us from our very real spiritual slavery. We were indoctrinated in the ways of this world. We were following them and they were in us. Just like the ancient Israelites in Egypt. His watching over and guiding situation and circumstance while we were still in spiritual sin helped us begin to build a degree of belief and understanding as the Father began to call us and lead us to Jesus Christ and the importance of that sacrifice. He has made freedom possible for us. But as we kept that night, as we remember the beginning steps of our spiritual freedom, it is impossible to forget the effects of the impact of the Passover we kept the evening before. As we mentioned last night, by example, as Israel was excited to leave Egypt, they heard the wails and the cries of people who were mourning the loss of their firstborn. Put yourselves in their place. If you lost your firstborn, how would you feel? Would you be angry? Would you be sad? What was Israel hearing come forth from Egypt as they experienced freedom, distinction between Israel and Egypt by God? The effects of the Passover was very much a part of the night they began to leave Egypt. And it should have made a big impact on all of us as we kept the night to be much remembered last night. These days of unleavened bread remind us that having our death penalty paid by our Savior, the work done by God in all the behind-the-scenes miracles of providing freedom and guiding our lives and the accompanying circumstances to make the beginning of spiritual freedom possible is not the end of the story. It's needed. We have to be there. We have to accept that. That sacrifice and everything that's attached to it but God wants us to continue. God will continue to watch and stand vigil over us, but expects us to grow in this conversion by choosing to obey Him, to participate in the relationship that we are blessed to have with Him. In these seven days of unleavened bread, the symbols that God chooses to use and desires us to focus on each year is unleavened bread as compared to leavened bread. The only difference between leavened bread and unleavened bread is just one ingredient. Bread, in this analogy, is something each person needs to gain strength and nourishment to function in, li in living. One has leavening as an ingredient. One does not. If you turn to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. Begin reading here with verse 5. It says, now when his disciples had come to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread. Then Jesus said to them, take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, it is because we have taken no bread. But Jesus, being aware of it, said to them, O you of little faith, 
Why do you reason among yourselves because you have brought no bread? Do you not yet understand or remember the five loaves of the 5,000 and how many baskets you took up? Nor the seven loaves of the 4,000 and how many large baskets you took up? How is it you do not understand that I did not speak to you concerning bread? But to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Then they understood that he did not tell them to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and Sadducees. What they believed to be right and wrong under the influence of Satan the devil. Christ's warning was to beware of the leaven or the effect of the teachings and doctrines that were predominant, led by the Pharisees and Sadducees on his disciples' way of thinking. The decisions that they would make as life began to unfold. That they would rely on what they had been indoctrinated in in the world that would cause them to make their decisions. Just like the ancient Israelites, Christ's disciples had been indoctrinated from birth in the ways of spiritual Egypt and had to be reoriented as far as times and truth. These days of unleavened bread are a part of God's teachings that he wants his people to focus on each year. As we begin these days, the impacts of both the Passover and the night to be much observed are very fresh on our minds, as they should be. And as Scripture indicates, should never leave our thinking and should influence our every thought, our every word, our every action, not just during this week, but for our lives. Those facts, those key facts should be driving us. These days of unleavened bread deal with whether our choices are becoming more unleavened as time progresses and whether the conversion that God began in us is continuing with our relationship with God and Christ growing closer or whether our choices could be leavened and causing a separation from God. God not separating from us, but us choosing and acting in a way that separates us from God. Using God's analogy, the difference will be what is analogous to the ingredient of leavening. The title of this sermon will be Beware of the Leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. In Exodus 12, verse 2, we read this. It said, This month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Israel had to be reoriented as far as truth. God began to reveal the true calendar and began to change their perspective on time. The effect of this began to slowly separate Israel from Egypt as God revealed, began to reveal about his calendar. God was beginning to separate his people for his purpose. In Leviticus chapter 23, if you would go back there. <coughs> Leviticus chapter 23. We'll begin reading here with verse 1. It says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, The feasts of the Lord which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, these are my feasts. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, a holy convocation. You shall do no work on it, it is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. These are the feasts of the Lord, holy convocations which you shall proclaim at their appointed times. 
Just as God did with Israel, one of the first things that God began to teach and reveal to his people was his calendar for his Sabbath day and his holy days. Many that I have talked to over the years recite their history as beginning with God revealing his Sabbath day to them. Not only, as has been told, is this a future test command, but for many spiritual lives and conversion processes, it began with this test command. I remember my dad. We were we tended a, a Baptist church for many years that I remember growing up. And there was an individual at work that was receiving information from the Worldwide Church of God and had a booklet from Mr. Armstrong having to deal with the Sabbath day. And over lunch one day, Dad was eating with this guy, and he said, well, what are you reading? And he told him, and, and Dad said, that's not right. I could prove that wrong. It's easy. And so Dad took the booklet, and he took it home, and by the time he finished, he said, I was wrong. And God began to open his mind by the Sabbath day to reorient his thinking that way and it's not just him but there's so many other examples that I could go to where I've talked to people and it would be a Sabbath day question that would begin their conversion that they would begin to have to think about these things but as we began to keep God's Sabbath day and the holy days we began to separate ourselves from everyone else that we had relationships in the world around us especially as we went to them and tried to convince them of what we had seen and they looked at us like we had just fallen off a cliff what has happened to you god was beginning to separate us and make a distinction between us and others around us as we learned what god's purpose was for these days we probably all began with do's and don'ts. What can I do? What can't I do? You mean I can't do that? Ah, I kind of like doing that. It begins that way. All of the physical do's and don'ts. From there we continue to progress to spiritual concepts and teachings that affect our beliefs, our words, our actions, Everything that comes forth from us are affected by revealed understanding from God. At each level of revealed truth, depending on our obedience to it, the separation between us and the society around us should have grown. If you look at your life like I can look at mine, sometimes that happened. Sometimes I didn't commit myself like I should have, and that difference didn't happen. But I suffered for it, and I learned from it, and hopefully made corrections as time moved forward. God is separating His people for His purpose. The spiritual firstborn who have been passed over are His for His purpose. As long as we continue to be led by God through His Spirit and choose to follow His lead, we grow closer to God and further from Satan and this world. That is the whole thing, and the key ingredient is sin. Leavening, getting it out of our thinking, out of our language, out of our actions, everything it's got to be moved away. These days teach us not only to continue to learn, but to guard what God has revealed as pure truth and not allow any leavening in to taint that truth. God's revealed truth was pure unleavened words, pure truth from a loving and caring God for all of us. 
we are to continue to allow God to teach us the pure truth through His Word and Christ's example in living. But there's a question that we each need to ask. Looking at your life today, how much of an effect does spiritual leavening have in your thinking, in your desires, in what you choose to do? In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, if you would turn there, another familiar set of scriptures. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. We'll begin reading here with verse 1. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles, that a man has his father's wife, or it's his stepmother. And you are puffed up. He sees an effect. They are puffed up. They are prideful, and have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I indeed, as absent in body but present in spirit, have already judged as though I were present him who has so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit may be saved, in the day of the Lord Jesus. Verse 6. Your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? This congregation had God's Spirit. This congregation had been called. They had come to the understanding of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. They understood that because of what God did, they were free from Satan. They had the opportunity of establishing a relationship with God. But leavening was affecting their decisions. Because we are called does not mean that leavening does not affect our choices and our decisions. Verse 7, Therefore purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Again, very much in this picture is Christ's sacrifice, the Passover for each of them. Verse 8, Therefore let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, all that they had been indoctrinated with, but with the revealed, unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Leaven thinking caused this congregation to allow sin in their midst, and they were prideful for their expression of how they dealt with it. They were proud of themselves. Sin was in this congregation of called out, spirit begotten individuals. The effect that they saw, that was witnessed, was the puffing up, the pride. But that wasn't the cause, that wasn't the leavening that had to be rid, that had to be gotten out. So much of the time, we as individuals can deal with the effects of sin without getting to the root of the problem. This principle for a congregation of allowing sin in and it affecting everyone with the effects that can be seen can happen to any congregation. But we can narrow this down to one individual and one mind. If I allow sin in and I begin to operate with that and pride can be seen in me and I am puffed up, It affects everything that's in me. All of the ways that I act and all of the ways that I speak. It can be affected. Leaven can spread in a congregation and leaven can spread in one mind if we allow it. How many times have we seen over the years within the church of God that someone begins to step off and teach a doctrine that is incorrect 
only to have so many others follow it. Once leaven comes into a thinking, it begins to spread. And it affects the totality of who that person is. The principle here is true for us too. We need to cleanse thoroughly the old leaven, the sin, the root of the problem, not just the effect. Ideas that we have accepted, whether before baptism or after baptism, we need to be cleansed. We need to become a new lump. And if you look at the meaning of that word, it is brand new. It's not taking a corrupt mind and changing this and tweaking that. It's becoming brand new, completely cleansed of what this world has indoctrinated each of us with. We are to keep these days of unleavened bread, which picture the entirety of our lives with sincerity, which means purity or single-mindedness, and truth that's unadulterated, untainted by any leavened idea. We hear this more and more as time goes on. We need to desire to see ourselves as God sees us. It's going to hurt to see who we are and the changes that we need to make. Because I guarantee you, we've made a lot of changes to come to the point we are today. We've separated ourselves from the world a lot today. But anything that we're holding on to is probably something that as human beings, we love the most and we don't want to give up. God is going, if, even if it requires to put us through the fire, He is going to require us to make a choice of whom we will serve. It will be up to us. Just the statement of needing to see ourselves as God sees us makes clear our utter dependence on Him to reveal to us sin that maybe we're still blind to. I gave the example recently of Debbie and I finding that little bag of pretzels in a shoebox, in our closet. And we ask ourselves, how in the world did it get there? We have no idea. We could have found that bag of pretzels during any week of the year, but we found it during the days of unleavened bread. That's God revealing and making a point to us that we should learn from. Leavening may be right in front of us, spiritual leaven, that we're not even paying any attention to. But God needs to bring it to our attention. He needs to reveal it to us, and then our participation is going to be required, all of us. There is another fact that these days picture that we must accept from God or spiritual leaven will continue to affect us in our choices. Each of us, before these days began, tried to clean our places of control of any leavening or leaven products. How many of us think we got it all? In all the years that you have cleaned for the days of unleavened bread, do you think there is a year that you got it all? That idea can cause us not to try to clean as much, but it shouldn't. We should always strive to do everything we can, but there is not a year that I believe that Debbie and I have ever got all the leavening out of our home. We've missed something. In Exodus chapter 20, if you'd like to turn there, I'm not going to read through the commandments. We've mentioned this before. But if you'd like to look down at the commandments, there are only two that say thou shalt. Revealed truth, revealed instruction from God. And there are eight that say thou shalt not. In other words, all the ways you've been indoctrinated by the ways of this world, you've got to cleanse from your actions, your thinking, everything about you. You've got to cleanse it 
from you. As we narrow down to the eight thou shalt nots, placing something or someone before God, where it dominates your attention, and God doesn't enter into the picture near as much as He should, erecting an image from creation to represent God, to worship it, to serve it. Again, we don't think of it in those terms when we're guilty of this sin, but it can happen. To take God's name in vain, to use it in vain, to represent it in vain. We shouldn't murder, we shouldn't hate, we shouldn't desire killing, hurt to others. Thou shalt not commit adultery or to be unfaithful in a relationship and a commitment in a relationship. You shall not steal. You shall not lie. You shall not covet. All of those things are practiced in this world and this world says this is the way you're supposed to act. All of the TV programs that are on, how many of these are practiced and thrown out as ways we should live. Who is the one being those characteristics describe? It is Satan. Satan has indoctrinated this world with his ideas and his characteristics. As God gave these commandments to ancient Israel initially and today reveals the full spiritual intent to all of us, God is revealing to us that there is a large amount of spiritual leaven that needs to be completely purged and cleansed from our hearts and our minds. As we choose to eat the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth, which is so key in these days, and follow God's direction through His Spirit, the miracle God can perform will bring us closer to Him and at the same time further separate us from Satan and all of his ideas and laws. As the Passover and night to be much observed emphasize, without what both the Father and Christ provides in love and service to us all, we can do nothing. We must be humble and repentant before God so that He will do for us what we cannot for ourselves. But in these days of unleavened bread, where God makes clear to us that He requires us to work in unison with both of them for His creation in us to continue and His grace to continue to grow and to be given is made evident every single day. God requires our participation with them to grow in our conversion to achieve the fullness of the stature of Jesus Christ himself, heart and mind. John chapter 6, please turn there. John chapter 6, verse 22. On the following day, when the people who were standing on the other side of the sea saw that there was no other boat there except that one which his disciples had entered and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but his disciples had gone away alone. However, other boats came from Tiberias near the place where they ate bread after the Lord had given thanks. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there nor his disciples, they also got into boats and came to Capernaum seeking Jesus. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set His seal on Him. 
Then they said to him, What shall we do that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. Therefore they said to him, What sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe you? What work will you do? Our fathers ate the manna in the desert, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. They're always focused on what they can get to eat. Rain down bread from heaven. Show us that sign. Verse 32. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me that everyone who sees the Son and believes in Him may have everlasting life, and I will raise Him up at the last day. All of this description is what God makes available. But littered throughout is the participation and the responsibility that the one who comes to Christ has in this process god is not going to cleanse us without our participation he requires it do we believe all that jesus christ has declared all that we read in scripture do we believe that Do we truly believe that Jesus Christ is the true bread from heaven to feed upon? Seven days we are to eat unleavened bread as a symbol of what should be in our hearts, desiring Jesus Christ in us. These people whom Christ was talking to saw him and heard his words but did not believe in him, not for the right reason. For us today that have made a spiritual covenant with God to see the promise offered here of becoming like them and experiencing eternity with them, we will have to see, we will have to understand, and we're going to have to make the choice to follow every single unleavened word that God reveals to us. It seems so simple, the instructions that are given. The only thing that makes it difficult is the desires in us that choose to battle it. It should be so easy for somebody to tell you what to do, and you just do it. But it's what's indoctrinated in us that can cause it to be a battle. It's the desires in me that can cause me at times to desire not to follow every word that is here, that is from Jesus Christ. How much spiritual leavening do we still have in our hearts and minds? Are we coming before God with the true reason and purpose in striving to root out the cause, and not just treat the effects that we see. Do we remember what we have just experienced in the Passover and the night to be much observed to help us move forward in what is spiritually expected of each of us to root out the characteristics of Satan that are in us, that still affect our decisions, affect our actions? 
Spiritual leavening is everywhere in this world, and it is spreading. It's spreading rapidly. And all of God's people, wherever they are, are subject to it. God has chosen not to take us out of this world. But he's chosen for us to be tested by it. He's chose for us to make choices against what Satan is doing and allowed to do in this world. Spiritual leavening is spreading everywhere. Do we realize how much we rely on God through his spirit to reveal the sin in us that still is affecting what comes forth from us this week god has designed and purposed for us to use physical symbols to make manifest spiritual principles and keys to our spiritual learning and growing so that as we strive to obey god in the right attitude for the right purpose that god will continue to reveal more truth unleavened truth that will light leaven still in our minds, still that we desire. It doesn't matter how many years you've kept the days of unleavened bread. There's more to learn. There's more to be cleansed from. There's more to take on as far as the heart and mind of our Savior. Final scripture, if you turn to John chapter 6. I guess I'm already in John chapter 6. Let's go to verse 48. Jesus Christ speaking. Says, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever, and the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore quarreled amongst themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. You take him on, or you have no life in you. You eat the unleavened bread spiritually every day, or you will cause separation from God, not from Satan. Participation, responsibility, accepting what we have been given. Verse 54, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. It's relationship, one with the other. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. Verse 60. Therefore many of his disciples, those who were following him, those who were learning from him, when they heard this, said this is a hard saying who can understand it when jesus knew in himself that his disciples com complained ab about this he said to them does this offend you what then if you should see the son of man ascend where he was before it is the spirit that gives the fle gives life the flesh profits nothing the words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. They are truth. They are unleavened. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who would betray him. And he said, therefore, I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my, by my father. Verse 66, from that time, 
many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. This saying, to this level of their conversion, how long had these disciples been with Christ? How much had they agreed with? How much changes had they made in their lives? But this teaching they could not grasp. This teaching they would not accept. They didn't grasp and understand it. Verse 67. Then Jesus said to the twelve, Do you also want to go away? But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. They had been blessed with this revealed truth. Each of us have been called, have been given, and have had revealed who Christ is and the entirety of the sacrifice of Him applied to us. We have the opportunity of accepting it fully along with all the responsibilities that are attached to it. If we ever say, this part is too hard for me, we will, as these disciples did, we will begin to separate and walk away from where God and Christ are leading. We have been made aware that through the sacrifice and God's choosing, we have been granted spiritual freedom from Satan and his control. But we are not immune to still hear it and have access to it and at times give in and succumb to it. We have experienced the blessings of being begotten by the Spirit from God and by His revealed truth. But like other congregations that we have read about, a leavened idea can affect an entire congregation. It can affect each of us individually. We are not at our finish line yet. As each of us prepared for Passover this year, I guarantee you each one of us said, we are not completely cleansed yet. There's more work that we have to do. There's more participation that I'm required to give. There's more revealed understanding and vigils that God the Father and Jesus Christ stand over me to work, situation, and circumstance to help me be cleansed. Even if that is a trial with a sickness or a disease or a persecution Whatever it is, God will bring to the forefront what we have in us that needs to be changed. Not every time that we ask for an anointing are we granted it on the spot. Sometimes God says you need to wait. Perhaps you need to wait till after the resurrection occurs. God will answer every anointing. I believe that with every part of my being. But He reserves the timing for when He's going to do that. We are blessed to be able to contemplate all that God has given us and made possible for us through the sacrifice of our Savior. Use these days of unleavened bread for what God designed them for and yield yourselves in a humble, repentant, thankful attitude before Him and beseech Him for you to be able to see in yourself what He can clearly see. And then when you have that, it is your job to throw it out immediately. Get rid of it, just like we would leavening if we found it. Get it out. God shows it to you for a reason. We have been given a most precious calling. Do not take it for granted. Do not take it for granted. So many times we can be in the church for so many years that we were used to jumping through hoops. 
But we've got to make sure we're continually learning and in the proper frame of mind, growing that relationship with both our Father and Jesus Christ. These days of unleavened bread have purpose with God. I pray for all of us that our purpose for these days are according to God's. Brethren, if you'll take your hymnals and please stand. We'll sing one more psalm for this service. If you take your hymnals and turn over to page number 89 in the older hymnal, that's page 133 in the newer hymnal, we'll sing words from the 118th Psalm, O give thanks unto our God. And after this hymn, I'd like to call on Mr. Jason McCoy to come forward give the closing prayer and ask a blessing on our, uh, our meal. And then after that, we'll have some brief local announcements so those of you on the Internet can stay tuned in for that. Again, page number 89 in the older hymnal, 133 in the new. Mr. McCoy. Dear great God, our loving Father, we do pause at the end of this service now to give you praise, to give you thanks. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the word that came and gave his life for each and every one of us. And Father, we ask now that you would be with us to help us through these days as we take in of unleavened bread, especially that spiritual unleavened bread that was brought to us by your son, our king, to help us to fill our lives with that, 
to keep out the leavening that is that sin, to remove it completely, to be that pure lump that you can work with. Father, we ask these things and that you would guide our process to show us where we need to further change, to show us how we need to be shaping our lives to your great image. And Father, to have that courage to make those changes, to apply that effort, to become as you are, perfect and clean. And Father, we ask that your dismissal on this on this service now and as we continue to join together to break bread that unleavened bread that we partake of this week together as family we ask your blessing upon the meal we ask that you would nourish our bodies by it and help us to grow closer to you and to each other through that process and father we know that there's many challenging times ahead we ask that you would continue to walk with us through each of those times whatever that is whether it's financial whether it's health spiritual battles that are waged against us we ask for your assistance and father we ask this now humbly through the name of your great son our king our savior the one who gave his life for each of us jesus the christ amen <laughs>